It's a breeze. It's also safer. Suspending glass over a major metropolitan city would be the mother of all chicken little scenarios. Not so with ETFE. If a piece were to come loose, when foils get detached from the structure, they fall down like a leaf in the wind. They will not hurt anyone, but just drop down safely. Safe enough and light enough to put over the heads of Houstonians. The material is here. The factory is ready. It's just a matter of pulling the trigger. To build a Houston dome is not a technical problem. It's about 5,000 tons of material. We're talking about production capabilities and technologies which are practically available and uh, they just have to be enlarged by a, probably a magnitude and off you go and do it. It would be a big job. But engineers estimate that it wouldn't be too different than other large-scale projects, like skyscrapers and tunnels. We would think it would probably take three to four years to, to clad it, and we would probably use 500 people for the installation. The day will come when the final pieces of the dome are locked into place. But the celebration that would follow the successful completion of the dome over Houston is tempered by worry. The original dream that a city-sized dome would protect Houston from nature's ravages was pure theory. Now builders will learn whether their audacious structure will actually make life better or prove to be the greatest work of folly in the history of engineering. Well before nature puts it to the test, residents will have to come to terms with the dome's impact on daily life. Having an enormous geodesic dome over an urban area would create a new barrier, but there's no doubt there would be a very real distinction between living inside the dome and living outside the dome. From the outside, the biggest change would be the view. The dome will become a striking and unavoidable new feature of the skyline. But step across the border and that perspective will be lost. From within, it will be nearly impossible to see the dome in its entirety. Buildings will obstruct the view. And as it arcs overhead, trying to make it out against the bright sky will be difficult. Of course, you'd see it at a ground level, but the fire higher up you got, it's, uh, it's a very delicate structure, so it almost disappear in the, in the sky, so I don't think you would be aware of the presence of this large structure. It's somewhat like a, a, a screen in your, your window at home. You see right through the screen because the struts of the screen are very, very small, so it just looks to you as, as a window that you're looking through. It will be so unobtrusive that city residents will give it no more thought than they once did of clouds passing overhead. The same clouds that are now outside the dome. Rain no longer drenches downtown Houston. But the sun hasn't gone away. Day after day, it beats down on those thousands of panels, dumping heat into the interior of the dome. Today's featured dish, Houston under glass. Skeptics argue that overheating is the dome's fatal flaw, but Fuller argued that just the opposite is true. Fuller called his domes chilling machines, self-cooling structures with little need for secondary cooling elements such as fans or air conditioners. The secret is in the way that the shape of the structure affects convection patterns. You're going to find another built-in efficiency by the way air naturally flows in a spherical structure. And the larger that structure, the more you'll be able to take advantage of that relative efficiency. As air heats, it rises. When it nears the apex, it cools and drops, causing the air to move in what's called a rolling donut pattern. This circulation prevents heat from building up at ground level. 
But Buckminster Fuller was prepared to go even further. He suggested adding adjustable vents at the top and bottom to further regulate temperature, keeping his dome warm in the winter and cool in the summer. But Fuller's idea was only an educated guess. We've never done any real experiments on very large, you know, the dome to see whether that actually happens or not. There's a very nice diagram that Bucky made. It made a lot of sense, you know, in terms of what, what he was saying, but that actually would take place is something that uh, uh, I wasn't too sure about. No large-scale test was available until 2001. We don't have any air conditioning units to cool either of the, the biomes. They are only cooled through natural ventilation. We have vents in both the top and the bottom, and that's the only mechanism we use for cooling the biomes. In Cornwall, temperatures average about 37 degrees during the winter. But one biome is kept at a tropical 90 degrees with plenty of humidity. The other at a desert dry 77 degrees. In Houston, vents located 1,500 feet above city streets will be rigged to open automatically when the temperature inside the dome rises. The vents will create a reverse chimney effect, pulling air in from the outside at the top where it's cooler. As it falls, it's forced out of vents near the base, circulating cool air through the dome. Properly calibrated, the system may also reduce Houston's killer humidity. Fuller believed that the vents would allow a dome's interior to maintain a temperature about 15% lower than the temperature outside, dramatically reducing the need for costly air conditioning. You could arguably say that Bucky was the first green architect. Fuller, back in the 60s and 70s, was not talking about climate change, but he was talking about sustainability. So he was an early environmentalist, I guess. And certainly that example points to the fact that the patterns we see now and interpret as such a surprising development were anticipatable a long time ago. But the environmental efficiencies of the dome are tempered by one fact. Maintaining nearly 150,000 inflatable cushions at a constant pressure takes energy, and lots of it. But the dome offers a perfect solution. Thousands of solar panels, perfectly arrayed to track Houston's famously persistent sunlight. With little need for air conditioning, residents will experience a new city but heat isn't Houston's only foe. Good morning, Houston. Hurricane Sonia is still pounding away at the suburbs. We're expecting she'll work her way up to a Category 2 hurricane with winds up to 102 miles per hour and 6 to 9 inches of rain. Of course, if you are in the dome, you're in luck. It'll be another beautiful day, a carefully regulated 72 degrees and just 10% humidity, which is why I advise don't leave the dome. <laughs> Obviously, one has to think a lot about social consequences uh, of covering a, a city like Houston, where all of a sudden you are coming into a position where you can actually drive the climate. I think the weather would be pleasant all the time, so one might miss the unpleasant weather. One might miss the joy of that first beautiful day in the spring, or the day when it finally stops raining, when it's been raining for a week in a row. After years of construction, after billions of dollars spent, the Houston Dome faces its biggest test. We need to consider protection against extreme weather events. And I'm talking about hurricanes. A Category 5 hurricane can flatten the city. And when such a storm eventually bears down on Houston, the geodesic dome's most beautiful design features, the sleek steel struts, the lightweight plastic panels, and the absence of interfering interior support columns, may lead residents to ask, will this delicate looking structure be strong enough to stand up to Mother Nature's worst? 
Against a powerful hurricane, the Houston Dome has several lines of defense. The first comes from its skin. High winds for ETFE cladding systems, not a problem at all, due to the material being extremely elastic and forgiving. They cope with basically any type of wind load if designed correctly. ETFE can withstand winds of 180 miles per hour, a higher velocity than even the strongest Category 5 hurricane. The pillows have an added layer of protection. It has an exterior layer, an inner layer, in the interior layer. As long as you can keep one of them, the whole skin of the dome still remains intact. Even if a panel ripped wide open, the rest of the dome's steel frame would be ready to bear the burden. But the panel's ability to resist the buffeting winds is only the beginning. Behind them stands a second line of defense. Mega structure of the kind that uh, we're talking about for Houston, Texas. First of all, we have to realize that it's a space frame, which is a three-way grid. The space frame, relying on the inherent stability of the triangle, provides a counterforce equal to any external wind load. In a rectangular structure, stress is borne by relatively few supporting elements. Remove one, and the rest are overwhelmed. But a geodesic dome, like the dome over Houston, has thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of supporting elements. The other thing about the geodesic dome is that the geometry allows it to have a great deal of inherent redundancies so that I can actually come along and take out some of the struts and the entire structure will still be incredibly stable. Even when one strut is removed, the load it bears is redistributed. Removing dozens, hundreds, or even thousands sends the load in new directions. So in order for a dome to really lose its effectiveness, you probably need to lose 20% of its components. With over 369,000 steel struts in the frame, Nearly 74,000 of them could fail before the dome would be compromised. Compared to the level of destruction wrought by hurricanes today, it would be a small price to pay. The cost of cleaning up and repairing every single building and house versus the cost of having to repair or restore the dome after a major hurricane, I think the advantages are with the dome. The economic challenge is that it's a, an enormous upfront investment, and yet that investment has the potential to pay itself back over time in damage that does not occur from hurricanes, in other sort of cleaning challenges that don't occur in the meantime. If people are able to embrace the longer-term economic perspective, there's a good chance that something like this could easily pay off. That strength could turn hurricane preparedness on its ear. Which is an irony in most uh, hurricane situations. Everybody's trying to quickly get out of the city. Now we can imagine them quickly trying to get in the city and being safe. Houston will set the standard for a new achievement in engineering, construction, and human ingenuity. If it was built, it would give us a very different world that we would be living in, so it could have a huge impact, and that's important for us all. As man seeks protection from climate change and faces an ever-changing world, cities could find new hope in a simple, strong, and soaring architectural triumph. A dome.